In 1941, to little acclaim, Orson Welles released his first ever film at just 26 years old. The film was a financial and critical flop, but has since been regarded as the greatest film ever made by many critics, including Roger Ebert. Many people have discussed this film and its innovative use of certain filmmaking techniques, but a lot of people don't know that these techniques had been used before in other films, such as the use of low-angle shots, which were used in Stagecoach just two years earlier. By the way, a little piece of trivia, Orson Welles watched the movie Stagecoach every night during the production of Citizen Kane, or at least so the story goes. The extensive use of matte paintings, for instance, expanded sets that would be too expensive to build in real life. The use of miniatures and matting in living objects are all common ones that don't usually get a mention, and yet this film probably broke more ground in all these techniques than any movie before, techniques that we still use today, except we use CGI. Most people discuss this film as merely a great film, or as an innovation in technology, but I want to analyze what I think makes it stand out above all other films. When film started, it was a novelty. It was a long, unbroken single shot, and so when narratives were added, they had to play out in wide shots like a play with no cuts and no edits. Later, cutting was invented, and then even later, D.W. Griffith invented the close-up. After that, even before we could imagine sound, we were already working on color. But even into the 1930s and 40s, a lot of the innovation in film came from edits and technology. The invention of the close-up was truly an innovation in editing, not so much framing as portraits did exist in the time before that. And things like matte paintings were really just forced perspective, and then later became a camera trick, taking advantage of unexposed black areas of film to add to a scene. Gone with the Wind, for instance, was innovative in its use of extreme and noir-esque lighting to frame out important scenes, and even then, the goal seems to have been more to create a moving picture of the Civil War South rather than a real film. There's something that was horribly missing, something that only cinema could do. It's hard to choose a single shot, so instead, I'll show you the entirety of Citizen Kane and explain as I go why I think this film created a uniqueness no other ever had. To start, as the movie opens, we see a shot of a fence, which is thematically relevant as the main character, Thompson, realizes that trespassing into a man's private life and memories doesn't ultimately give him a full picture of who that man was, if only the modern news media could learn that lesson. Going in, we get shot after shot showing us the massive expanse of the Xanadu Mansion grounds, every luxury imaginable, and yet all of it in disrepair and empty. Finally, we come to the bedroom of Charles Foster Kane, an old man dying. We see the superimposition of snow over the scene as Kane holds a snow globe, giving the effect that he himself is sort of inside it as he says his last words. Rosebud. Surreal theater was a thing even then, but here we see the beautiful effect of superimposing one image upon another to create a surreal filmic moment, much as the German expressionistic films did years earlier. Kane dies. When he drops the snow globe, it shatters. We see a nurse enter, reflected in the snow globe, using an optical effect. One frame, two shots. Something this movie does beautifully, and also, the use of mirrors and reflections is thematically very important later. We next go to a newsreel of Kane's life. Quite cheekily, the film goes through every major event that we're about to see entirely from an outsider's perspective. Now, that was a risky move at the time because it means that there are no mysteries for the audience to discover. Well, no mysteries except one. Here's a man that could have been president who was as loved and hated and as talked about as any man in our time. But when he comes to die, he's got something on his mind called Rosebud. Now, what does that mean? This is the rest of the movie, the journey to uncover what Rosebud is. Along the way, Thompson meets an assortment of people who knew Charles Foster Kane, who tell him the story of Charlie as he grew from a young entrepreneur millionaire to an old, bitter, lonely man. 
Thompson is kept in the shadows, and we never see a clear shot of his face, and that allows us to even better put ourselves into the shoes of this reporter, as if the characters are talking directly to us. Now, the lighting is not new, but this dedication to the choice of keeping this actor's face hidden the entire movie is. And it's daring because... This was at a time when filmmakers worried a lot about the audience getting confused, and even really gypped if they didn't get to see glamorous beauty shots of actors. The first story of Kane is of Kane's youth. Citizen Kane is often remembered for inventing the wide depth of field in movies, but it really didn't. Lots of films used it before, just not to this degree. For those who don't know, deep focus is when objects in the foreground and background are all in focus. We begin the story of young Charles Foster Kane with a full shot of the boy, but as his parents discuss sending him away with Mr. Thatcher to be educated before inheriting a huge fortune, he becomes smaller and smaller, more insignificant as the adults take the frame. This is important to why Charles Foster Kane does the things he does. Often in the film, he makes bad choices just to prove that he's the one in control and that no one will ever make another decision for him. This shot emphasizes the full gravity of his mother's choice over her son's life. Next, we hear that Kane has rejected all financial advice and chooses a newspaper which Mr. Thatcher was going to liquidate. He again obviously does this to prove that he, and not Thatcher, will make his decisions. In a flashback of Thatcher's last meeting with Kane, we see that his insistence on going against Thatcher has caused the newspaper to go broke, at which point he finally liquidates it. In the end, Kane, very tellingly, has this exchange. If I hadn't been very rich, I might have been a really great man. What would you like to have been? Everything you hate. Here we are teetering on the first of many visual breakthroughs, as the angle deliberately makes this room look smaller with medium-sized windows, but as Kane, defeated, walks toward the background, we see they're actually in a giant room, and Kane truly is very small and insignificant in it. This visually shows us both his feelings and the true reality of the situation. Cain is a small man trying to tower over and break down everything that comes against him. As he takes charge again, stating, it means we're bust, he walks up to the desk, eclipsing the whole scene and hiding most of the background that shows his true stature. Next, Thompson visits Mr. Bernstein, Cain's manager, who tells us how he came in and took over as head of the newspaper office, even living in his office for a time, and remaking the front page three times in one night. This flashback also shows Cain as a young idealist and his dedication to protect the people and be loved by them. This is also as good a time as any to mention that this film has some of the most realistic dialogue ever, mainly because it's chaotic. People overlapping sentences and talking over each other and even losing their trains of thought. I thought it would be a nice little gesture. Uh, the, uh, ask new, them to sit down, will uh, you please? New publisher? It's Kane's name. He owes the money for the board to the board of The bank's decision on all matters I don't to... hold with signing my boy away to any bank. Is... Later, Thompson, still not having found the meaning of Rosebud, goes to see Kane's only real friend, Jed Leland, played to perfection by Joseph Cotton. He now lives in a retirement home. Leland talks serenely, and we see that unlike Kane, he became a very happy and fulfilled old man. Then we get this. Now, superimposition during a fade-out wasn't unheard of, but it was pretty rare, and to this day, I doubt it's ever been done more effectively. It adds a real cinematic uniqueness, having Leland still visible for just a few seconds, instead of just a simple fade-out, visually letting us be pulled into the story even before we lose sight of him. Leland tells the story of how Kane and his first wife were madly in love, and how Charlie married her after a short trip rather impulsively. Kane and her seem very close, and through a truly brilliant montage, we see their relationship strain through the dialogue growing colder, and this is also reinforced by the fact that Kane's wife is now reading the rival newspaper. Then, as the camera backs out, we see that as the years have gone by, they've not only stopped sitting so close, but they actually have a longer table, as if to put even more distance between each other. 
With the movie on mute, you could understand what's going on in this scene. The long table and short table relationships could be shown through photography, but the use of montage to make that transition makes this moment very specifically cinematic. It couldn't be done to this degree in any other medium. That is visual storytelling at its finest. Leland then tells how Kane met Susan, a lower class girl who Kane is charmed by because of her childlike innocence, which causes Kane to tell her that when his mother died, her belongings were sent to him and that he's looking for items from his childhood. Now that is really important, but we'll get to that later. The fact that she doesn't know who he is and likes him just for himself causes Charlie to grow more fascinated with her, and he finds out that her mother wanted her to be a singer, and he immediately starts working to that end. Leland also tells how Kane sought to become a governor, which underlines several lines of the other characters who have all said that Kane would become the president, something Kane himself admits he aspires to. Here in another purely filmic moment, we see the audience at Kane's rally watching him, as we, the real audience, crane over their heads. This shot was created with a matte painting and an optical zoom which was added in post. Kane shows his contempt for his opponent, Jim Geddes, by calling out that he is not only a crook, but a mob boss, and says he will, if appointed, hire a special prosecutor to convict Geddes. Uh, I could say so much about how... <laughs> How irrelevant that is, but, uh, let's just move on. Here's our first shot of Jim Geddes himself, and we're not even told who he is. He's watching from on high over another shot, which was created using a shot of the podium, a shot of Geddes, and a map painting to bridge the gap. This painting of the audience is deliberately at a skewed angle, which shows the skewed view Geddes has, and of course, the height difference shows who has the real power in this scene. This also mirrors young Charlie in his window as his mother, looking out at him, is about to make the decision that would change his life forever. This is just magnificent visual callbacks, um, and, and we see more going forward. I'll, I'll show you some more in a second. After the show, Charlie and his wife are summoned to Susan's home, where it's discovered Geddes is planning to blackmail Kane by telling the press he's having an affair with Susan. As they argue, Kane is left in the background, in the shadows and the others are discussing how Kane has no other option, all of them growing larger and closer in the frame, again, symbolically replaying that earlier scene of Kane as a kid. Here, Kane makes the decision that decides the fate of his election. When told by his wife that the decision has been made for him, Kane says, There's only one person in the world to decide what I'm going to do, and that's me. His wife leaves, taking her son, who is never seen again. However, in the newsreel at the beginning, we find out that both of them died in a car accident, which underpins a very sad note. When Charlie saw his son earlier, that was the last time he would ever see him, presumably. Kane loses the election, and we get a really famous scene here. Orson Welles could not get his camera low enough to get the scene how he wanted, so they actually dug a hole in the studio floor to make the scene work. Now, normally, a low angle denotes power. A powerful person towering over the camera is iconically seen as a position of authority. In fact, you could argue that some other shots in this movie really started the use of low angles to show who's in charge as a critical part of our filmic grammar, although other films, again, had done it before. But here, it has a different purpose, showing us the ceiling. Why? Because... Although he is rich and later spends a great deal of money on a mansion, this is the highest height he will ever hit. Again, this is only my interpretation, but I think this is to show he's reached the ceiling of his potential, and there is no higher in the rest of his life for him to go. Later, we see that Kane has to build Susan an opera house because she wasn't good enough to get in one as a singer. Oh. And then we get this. Not only is it purely visual, as the song being sung only serves to motivate the movement, but I would argue this is the second truly impossible camera move in film history. The first one being earlier in this film, which I waited to mention till now so I could show them together. 
The passing through this sign is impossible too. Immediately, we know who we're here to see and where we are and what we're doing there. Both shots are movements that transcend walls and barriers and logic and human feasibility. It's one of the first shots that is impossible for any other medium to replicate. And yes, there had been horizontal camera moves past the wall of a set and stuff like that, but in the end, there's no difference between that and a play with a false wall between two sets. This is the essence in two shots of what Citizen Kane gave us, and arguably what it brought to the art form as a whole that no other film has. I mean, think about the directors that take this sort of thing for granted. Robert Zemeckis, David Fincher, even Steven Spielberg, um, even go back earlier, even Alfred Hitchcock was doing these impossible camera moves. And think about all of the filmmakers who use these sort of moves in their toolkit, uh, whether it's to create an ominous atmosphere, whether it's to create a mood, there's so many things you can do with it, but now it is utterly taken for granted. And that is what Orson Welles gave us. That is the treasure trove of what he gave us, was the potential to use a camera for film in ways that it could not be used for any other medium. So Leland starts writing a scathing review of Susan's performance, and Kane finds out as Leland is passed out drunk and finishes the review for him, bad-mouthing Susan's talent. Presumably this is to show that he is a fair person and that he is he wants to prove that he he will allow this review to be published because it is truthful and he does realize that. We see Kane against a blank wall and in the background the ceiling in view once again, but this time behind only Leland as Leland is fired. This is the greatest height Leland will hit in his career as well. Now, I originally thought that this shot had been filmed with a split diopter lens, and I for think it, I forget which interview it was in, I think it was in his discussions with Peter Bogdanovich, in which he said, actually, this shot was accomplished by having Orson sit in front of a rear screen projector, and they had already filmed the background with Joseph Cotton, and then they just filmed him in front of the rear screen projection. And if that's true, then this is one of the best rear screens I have seen, probably because of that dark noir-esque lighting. It really is hard to tell that it's an effect at all. And afterwards, we get a fantastic matte shot that ends the sequence. This again was a creative choice as it gives the audience time to adjust and continue taking in the loneliness and isolation of this scene that we're leaving while putting one foot firmly back in the present. Once again, showing Kane very, very small, we see Leland, much larger in the frame, is the one who ultimately came out on top and has lived a happy life afterward, while Kane never did. Next, Thompson visits Susan, who explains how Kane treated her as a child her entire life. He forces her to become a singer as her mother wanted, never giving much regard to her own desires. We even get to see the same scene from a different perspective, something which Akira Kurosawa would later use in Rashomon nine years later. In fact, you could argue that this film may have inspired the framing device in that film. Susan tries to commit suicide, and again, we see a masterful use of shadows as makeshift mat holdouts. To get the shot in focus properly, Kane and the bed were filmed. Then, as you can see, the bottle of poison and the cup were added separately so that they would also be in focus for the close-up. If you look very closely, you can actually see the slight fade-out on the medicine bottle where the shadow ends so the picture wasn't able to be exposed properly to get the whole bottle in there, which is kind of a fun little fact. Now, just to point out once again, this is something that we do all the time and take for granted. Just, if you don't, if you can't put something in a scene for real, you just add it in in CGI later. This was pretty revolutionary at the time, because while matte paintings were common use, the idea of matting in objects into a scene which could be filmed wasn't so commonplace, so this is pretty unique. 
he allows her to stay at home and build Xanadu, his colossal mansion, and we see how small he is inside it. In fact, he's never shot in any kind of imposing way while he's here. The entire space feels empty and hollow. Again, a great use of matte paintings to fill out the shadows. I mean, that's just awesome. After keeping her alone for years at a time with nothing to do but work jigsaw puzzles, Susan leaves Kane. The final interview Thompson does is with Raymond, Charlie Kane's butler. Raymond says he did hear Kane say Rosebud one other time. In our last flashback, we see Kane after Susan has left. Again, to maintain the aesthetic deep, deep focus, a matte painting is used to bridge two shots together in yet another shot that shows Kane as a small, broken man, the smallest he's been seen yet, swallowed by the home he's built. He trashes Susan's room, which looks like a child's room. It could be argued that he was trying to treat Susan how he wished to be treated, trying to relive his childhood through her. Yet in the end, he ended up doing exactly what his own mother had done to him, even forcing her into a career that her mother picked out for her. As he trashes the room, Kane picks up a small snow globe, with a cabin inside that looks like his snowy home that he'd last seen as a child. With misty eyes, in one of the most genuine, vulnerable, and heartbreaking moments ever put to celluloid. Rosebud. Kane wanders out. The ghost of a smile on his face, past a room that reflects himself hundreds of times into infinity. It just reinforces the film's themes that we are seeing Kane as many different people, a different person really for each account of his life. This is why some of the accounts contradict each other. And this snow globe is our last clue as to what Rosebud means. Clearly something reminds him of his childhood and that thing is Rosebud. Finally, Thompson wanders through the mansion, and we see all of the millions of statues and pieces of art that Kane collected in his life. Somehow now he's gone, it suddenly seems full to bursting, but to Charlie, it never seemed he could fill it up enough to fill the void he felt inside. You could also argue that his obsession with buying statues is a need to fill the space he's in with people, perhaps a deep-seated feeling of loneliness. In fact, the only time his obsession with statues is directly addressed to him from another character is in a scene that's stuffed full of people. There's a lot of pictures and statues in Europe you haven't bought yet. You can't blame me, Mr. Bernstein. They've been making statues for 2,000 years, and I've only been buying for five. As they walk through Kane's possessions, Thompson realizes what Rosebud truly means. Maybe Rosebud was something he couldn't get or something he lost. I don't think any word can explain a man's life. No, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. A missing piece. So Thompson leaves, and leaves us too. We, the audience, and the audience alone, get to know the answer. What is Rosebud? And I'm not going to spoil it if you haven't seen it. Because if somehow after... Oh gosh, I don't even know. I mean... 80 years you still have somehow not managed to see this movie or had it spoiled for you i think it's a great excuse to check it out it's not an expensive movie to buy but i will put it in a general sense so that if you haven't seen it i won't be spoiling it for you rosebud in a general sense is an object that symbolizes the loss of childhood showing that Deep down, all Cain really desired was the childhood that he missed out on. The final shot is a reverse of the first, a no trespassing sign, tying together with the major theme that, no matter how much we see, we'll never understand another person and their motivations completely. And sometimes, we just need to leave well enough alone. Citizen Kane is one of my favorite movies. And I always find myself both smiling and oddly emotional after I see it. A lot of movies have tried to make the audience feel as if they've seen the true nature of someone's soul, but none have ever succeeded like this film, at least not to me. It makes no judgments about who Charlie Kane is, it just presents you with a full, 
body of reasons why he behaves as he does and lets you judge him for both the good and the bad. It's no wonder we see this film as one of the greatest of all time, because it wrote a lot of the visual grammar we use today. From the angles, to the close-ups, to the staging and blocking, the dialogue, even the optical effects, which were basically precursors to the way we use CGI and models and everything else we use now, nothing in the art form was ever the same after Citizen Kane.